Welcome to BizTech C-Suite Conversation Show. Today we speak to Bertrand Saye, Managing Director at FCM Travel Solutions Asia. Now, FCM is one of the largest global business travel management companies with a 24-7 worldwide reach in almost 100 countries. And it's the flagship business division of the ASX-listed Flight Center Travel Group. Now, welcome to the show, Bertrand. Hi, Brian. Nice to see you and thanks for having me. Now, for a start, could you give us an overview of the Flight Center Travel Group, its history, and more specifically than FCM Travel Solutions? Well, uh, Flight Center Travel Group is an Australian company that was created um, in the 80s uh, by our founder, who is still actually the CEO of the company. His name is uh, Screw Graham Turner. He's quite a celebrity in Australia. And it all started, I mean, back in the UK, to be fair, it started with like, uh, he booked a few double-decker buses and he went for tours around Europe with like young students or whatever. And it was very fun at the time. And when he came back to Australia, he opened his first travel shop and that's how everything started. I mean, now this is obviously a huge empire. Just before COVID, it was around 24 billion uh, dollar of, of business um, around two big divisions, one around the leisure travel and Flight Center is obviously a very big leisure brand, particularly in Australia, but in other parts of the world. And then another division, which is around corporate travel, uh, which FCM is part of because we are the, the TMC of Flight Center Travel Group in a nutshell. Um, so it's been a very exciting story, actually, getting the company from where it started to where we are now, and it's quite fascinating. So Bertrand, I gotta make a confession. I was a flight center travel customer in 1989. Ooh. <laughs> when no, I was studying okay. in Australia, so very long time. So I, I understand a business and I've seen its, its growth over the decades. But today for your business itself, FCM Travel Solutions, which are the key markets and, and who are your key customers in Asia? So we own our business in 24 countries around the world. So that's when we actually own the operations and all that. Mm -hmm. And we are represented by partners in around 100 countries, as you said earlier. Uh, if you look particularly at Asia, we own our business in China, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Singapore, and India. And we just announced last week uh, an acquisition in Japan, which is going to become our a uh, new market in the region. And obviously we are extremely big in, uh, in Australia and New Zealand, but I, I think we have a, a, an amazing coverage around the region uh, when it comes to market presence, obviously. And other than that, USA has been our fastest growing market over the past five years, as well as Europe. Uh, we, we started in Europe from the UK and now we are getting into continental Europe with acquisitions in France, Germany, and the Nordics, uh, like you know, Sweden and Denmark and countries like that. So it's a usually, you know, we are very much where our corporate travelers are because you know those are the main hubs for corporate travel, obviously. So yeah, that, that's the ambition. Now, Bertrand, you joined the business in 2015, but the business has changed significantly since the pandemic hit us. But to set the stage, tell us about how the business looked like pre-pandemic. Yeah, so it's a good question. So first of all, I joined the business in 2015 because the business was already changing and, and they needed kind of new blood to kind of lead the company for transformation and transformation would include a lot of digitalization and much more um, IT savviness, should I say. So this is why I joined because I thought it was a very interesting challenge and obviously we went through a lot of this transformation and then in 2020, COVID hit, and this is some sort of a reboot of the entire strategy and, and, and structuring. Um, and, and basically the, the business now is not that different to what it was in 2020, except that we have less people and we've done a lot of things during the whole crisis time to get to where we are now. But overall, we are quite happy with what we've done over the past 18 months or so. Um, and I'm sure we are going to talk about that in, in more details, but, um, you know, it was an accelerated transformation to a large extent to get to a leaner structure, much more efficient while growing our customer base, which is 
obviously the ambition of most companies was there to survive. Absolutely, but can it, can you give us a sense of how much did, uh, was the in business impacted financially? Could you share some numbers with us? So I can, because, so first of all, we are a listed company, as you said earlier, we are listed at the ASX in Australia on the FLT, which is our, um, you know, code. Um, we've basically announced our full year results uh, two weeks ago. Um, so we've, sh we, we've posted a loss, obviously, over the past financial year. I think what is very important, and I think, you know, we were quite blessed with that. When all of this started, very early in the process, in April 2020, we went back to our investors and we told them, listen, we are going through very difficult times. We think that this is not going to be a short thing. This is going to be quite a long crisis and we need your support. And we got the support from the market. We actually managed to get 1.2 billion of fresh cash to survive. Obviously the trade-off was that we had to make massive savings to make sure that we were not burning the cash and wasting it for no reason. And this is why we had to make drastic decisions. And I think we made it public, so I can share that with you. But before COVID, we used to have 22,000 people globally. Mm -hmm. And now we are probably more around 7,000, 8,000, which wow. is obviously a massive staff reduction. And as you might appreciate, because of our business model, um, HR cost is, is by far the highest cost uh, that we have in the company. So that's, that's what we reduce the most. Luckily, in Asia, um, we had to make much lesser reduction for many reasons. One is because China um, you know, recovered much faster than most markets globally. And I don't know if you are familiar with China, but back in uh, June 2020, the business was actually getting back already from a domestic standpoint. That's right. And the other reason is because we also used some markets in Asia, and, and Malaysia is one of them, to um, outsource some of our global um, jobs um, and, and, and make sure that we were benefiting from, um, let's say, a less costly labor market and, and things like that. So that's why we implemented a lot of uh, new global uh, disciplines in Malaysia. And that was very good for us because we didn't have to reduce our staffing that much um, in, in, in the Asian markets. Um, and obviously now we are very much ready for the rebound. So yeah, that's all what happened over the past 18 months. So that, that's interesting. So what you did was you, and, and, and from a business, and literally this was like a business turnaround literally to pivot, right? So you, you went from, you went to about one third of your size and also even within that size, your cost base was even lower because you shifted some of those roles to a cost base like Malaysia, which is a very low cost base. Is, is that a shared services hub in Malaysia? Yes, you can call it like that in KL. And, and what sort of size is that? We have around uh, probably 80 people now in Malaysia. It's not, it's not like one of those massive, you know, offices and all of that, but it's a significant presence. Okay. Now, in the travel tech uh, space, obviously, innovation and digitization has been on steroids over the last uh, uh, 18 months. Could you share some of the, the digitization projects that you, you basically implemented as part of your, your uh, turnaround strategy? And uh, what sort of uh, results have you got out of it? Excellent. So one thing I can tell you is that as part of the money we got from our investors, they told us, reduce your cost. But they also said, we want to make sure that you are investing our money in the things that will get the best return for us as investors after uh, COVID. So the first one was obviously technology, technology, technology. For, we built this um, uh, project or concept, should I say, called Grow to Win. And we decided to invest some money in key areas of the business that would help us bring our brand, reputation, and um, I guess offering for our customers to become uh, much more relevant to them and make sure that we were gaining uh, market share and, and, and showing more value to investors again. So, in terms of technology, this was all about digitalization of the travel ecosystem. 
And again, FCM is helping company to travel better. So that means helping company to save money on travel, but also making sure that everyone within the company knows uh, what's the travel policy, how to uh, get the best deals from different vendors, being airlines and hotels and things like that, but also bringing a lot of digitalization and more and more, this is about optimizing workflows within company. You know, travel demand is usually quite cumbersome. You need to call someone, we'll come back with a quote, then you need to go to your manager with an email or something to ask for approval and then coming back and all. So we found a way to optimize all of this and have a fully automated workflow that starts from demand management. So the moments you need to go on a trip to when you come back and connection with expense management and things like that to have you know, all the invoices and all of that processed in a very efficient manner. So the, the, the time you save along the way is very substantial and it allows you to be much more efficient in your company dealing with your travel management while keeping a great control on your cost and obviously the people traveling so that was one layer the other layer is obviously all about information i mean you know brian you are sitting in in, in malaysia obviously and as you know each time you even think of going somewhere the first question is can i go if i can go, what are the different rules and regulations along the way? And, and we wanted to bring to our customer base a very advanced set of technology that could allow them to understand better that where the restrictions, depending on your nationality, your vaccination status, I mean, all of this is, is part of the equation those days. And, I've, <laughs> and on top of that, it's fair to say that the rules are changing almost on a daily basis. I mean, uh, you know, depending on where you're going, there is always something coming up, could be linked to an airline, a connecting point, the country of origin. The, all of this brings a lot of complexity, which makes our business as a travel management company even more exciting because it's an opportunity for us to show a lot of value to our customers along the way. And it's interesting because Bertrand, from what you've just described, there's another, uh, there is also another benefit of you becoming an uh, uh, much more efficient and optimizing. It's greater customer intimacy because Absolutely. essentially when you deploy your solutions there, your customers have more transparency across the workflow and they're not going to switch out from you if they're doing a good job. Yeah, I mean, Obviously, building loyalty with our customer base is a, is a huge um, area of focus of us. And, and I, I, we are proud to say that during the COVID time, we haven't lost customers. Like I think our retention rate last year was 99%, which is absolutely amazing. And I think our customers were recognizing that we were going through difficult times, but that we kept the business very much running and coming up with innovative solutions that were helping them to do what they need to do with travel, you know what I mean? And to make sure that they had a partner that they could trust and rely on to, to do the job that they were not meant to do, you know what I mean? Yes. And, and I think, yeah, you're right. I mean, we are very proud of that, I believe. And, 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 and so what, what you are saying is that we are building stickiness with our customer base. And I position it more in the sense that we want to be seen as bringing value to our customers. And if we bring value, usually customers don't leave because they understand why they are working with you, I guess. Now, Bertrand, I want to zoom in on the aviation sector because you worked in Airbus before. Yeah. Private jet usage has soared among businesses and high net worth individuals globally. Um, What's demand like been in Asia and how have you been able to tap into that as a group? So this is an excellent question. So I'm not going to go into the macroeconomics of the aviation sector, which is very complicated in itself. But as you know, if you look at the big um, you know, manufacturers, both Airbus and, and Boeing, none of them collapsed despite that at the beginning, everybody was like, oh my God, you know, it's going to be. But in the end, you know, I mean, it's just about adaptation. When it comes to charter flights, um, so first of all, we as a company, we have a charter flights uh, subsidiary, which is called Avmin uh, in Australia. 
And the reason why we actually uh, booked this company a while ago was originally because of the mining industry. Um, and as you know, because they operate mines in very remote areas and stuff, sometimes they need to have private planes and charters to uh, move their people around. So with the pandemic, we've seen a much higher demand in terms of charter flights. And, and to answer your question, I know it's, it's a long answer, but there is two big segments. One, those are corporate customers that need to move their people to, um, could be like a, a plant, could be a mine, could be, um, for example, the seamen and all of that, that you need to move across the, the planet. And when there is no flights available, you need to find ways to make that happen. So usually what we do in this kind of circumstance is going to large airlines. Um, you know, in Singapore, it could be Singapore Airlines, it could be a scoot or something, and say, I want your aircraft that you are going to operate, but I'm going to take care of the management of the charter. Um, so that, that's one area, and usually we use basically the same aircraft that you would see uh, in civil aviation. And the second segment was more like private um, charter, which were more for um, wealthy families that needed to, to travel, and at the time where you couldn't find any, uh, you know, uh, civil you know, aviation flights or something, that was the best way to travel. And, and we've seen very high demand of those uh, uh, family charter flights, which are usually, you know, aircraft between, let's say, four to 20 seaters. So that would be the average size. And, and um, you know, so for example, one big, big, big wave that we've seen of demand was in India during the past, or the last, should I say, uh, wave of COVID, which as you know, has been quite dramatic and very much, uh, uh, seen in the media, but a lot of people tried to fly out of the country before things got too bad. And the demand in, in charter flights, particularly to countries like Dubai and all of that, has been absolutely huge. And they were all those kind of family type charters, uh, four to 20 seaters, um, just to move the family across. Now, how does the current corporate uh, business landscape look like globally? and within Asia, because in Europe and US, they've already started opening up over the summer. Do you, uh, what do you see happening in Asia as we start to open up? And governments also realize that it's an endemic. We've got to come to live with this. Even Australia is starting to change its mind in terms of how they view living with the endemic. Exactly. So if you look at the three continents, Asia Pacific has been the most conservative, with more, more, more country um, going for a zero COVID kind of attitude. So if you look at New Zealand, Australia, China, uh, Japan now, which is like, you know, in this, uh, you know, crisis management mode, most countries have gone for zero COVID strategy. And that is obviously uh, quite an issue for travel because uh, travel is always seen as a factor for a COVID increase. So uh, controlling border, is seen as the first kind of shelter to avoid COVID to come in. So that's, that's a problem when you are in corporate travel. The USA um, or America, should I say, and Europe have had a complete different approach toward COVID. So they were obviously much more open. Um, Europe with the Schengen area has reopened like back in May this year, I think. So people could travel um, you know, in any country within the continent without any um, issue. Uh, and I think they accelerated vaccina uh, vaccination massively. And that was for them a, a bit of vaccination plus some sort of safety. You know, France, for example, launched what they call the pass sanitaire, which is a bit like uh, what, what you would call trace together uh, in, in Singapore. It's kind of a similar concept where, you know, if you want to go to a restaurant or thing, you need to show that you are either vaccinated or a negative PCR test. So all those things have improved the confidence within the continent. And then they let kind of things go. And from what we see, it's going quite okay. I mean, yes, there is a few waves here and there, but overall it's quite controlled. So when it comes to corporate travel, big boost in America, big boost in uh, Europe, and in Asia, it's still today very much about domestic travel. 
So China was the uh, engine of domestic travel across the region because it's obviously a big, large domestic market. And what we've seen in China is that our volume of domestic business is higher than what it was pre-COVID. The other big market was actually Australia, which did pretty well for a very long time until uh, the past two months, which has been a bit of a catastrophe uh, in, in the country because now they are closing, uh, you know, within Australia borders between the different states and it's becoming very difficult to travel domestically in, in Australia now. For the rest, I think everybody's watching. Borders are still very much closed around the continent. Uh, Hong Kong that went from a 21 days to seven days quarantine is now back to 21 days. Uh, Singapore is starting some different um, initiatives. So the most exciting one is the one toward Germany and Brunei. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but they are opening what they call the VTL for vaccinated travel lane. So if you travel on certain particular flights and you are fully vaccinated, you can enjoy coming back to Singapore with without um, having to do a quarantine. The requirement is that you do a test before departure, a test at arrival, and then a test at day three and day seven. Uh, and if all the tests are negative, you are free to do whatever you, you want when you arrive in Singapore. And the great news as well is that this VTL is open to not only residents of Singapore, but potential tourists or business travelers that want to come to Singapore for any reason. So this is the first time we see that level of openness uh, for one particular segment of customer within Singapore. And it's great news because we hope that if things are successful, then it will uh, give to other countries uh, the confidence that they could reopen with a certain level of control. Um, and, and that's obviously great news for, for us as a business. One thing I can tell you is that they opened this VTL, I think three weeks ago, and we've seen a massive peak of um, tickets uh, for Germany, um, which is very interesting because it means that as soon as you open a route, people just buy tickets for it. So it means the confidence is not um, you know, bad. It's just that people need to know that they are going to be able to travel safely and come back home, which as you know, has been a problem in the past. So it's rebuilding confidence basically. And so as part of this, do you see that in terms of demand expectation, there is a the, the huge expectation, whether from a financial sector or from the industry itself, that there's going to be a huge element of revenge travel spending. Do you think that's going to uh, extend to the corporate space as well? And, and is, is that a trend that you see moving forward? Um, yeah, I definitely think like, like we have a lot of uh, uh, German-based customers in Singapore. So as a consequence, when these things happen, they want to jump on the first plane and get there. And the same thing happened for Hong Kong. You remember when Singapore and Hong Kong were trying to build this travel bubble that uh, never really happened. But each time, you know, the bubble was happening, each time the level of booking was going very high. And actually it was very difficult to find a seat in the first month post the opening, you know, because all flights were full. So yes, there is definitely a need. There is definitely a, a desire. Um, and, and then like always, you know, you will see a peak at the beginning and after a while it will regulate because it will be about, uh, you know, why do you need to travel? Where do you need to go? And, you know, corporate travel is also very much about budget control, risk control. So all of those things have a factor when it comes to uh, buying travel, obviously. But we definitely see each time we open a new route and there is uh, some uh, opportunity for people to travel safely without too much restrictions, we always see a great pickup, that's for sure. But Bertrand, one of the things that uh, is very untested at the moment is the fact that people are so used to now doing business online and doing business on Zoom, that business travel will actually fall and will not reach pre-COVID levels. Is that a view that you share? Absolutely. I have to say yes, for multiple reasons. So you say usage of Zoom, Teams, and all of that, which are definitely bringing 
a novel level of collaboration within companies. And this is here to stay. I mean, that's very obvious. We are talking on Zoom right now. I mean, in another circumstance, I would probably have flown to uh, KL to see you or you coming to Singapore, you know what I mean? So that makes a lot of things easier and possible. The other thing is a lot of companies are focusing on sustainability um, and sustainability, um, you know, obviously travel has an impact on uh, CO2 emission. And so companies are looking at finding the right balance. Now, that being said, I do believe that corporate travel is here to stay. In markets like China, as I told you earlier, we've seen you know, us coming back to the pre-COVID level pretty fast, actually, because there is one reason behind this, is that we do corporate travel for a reason. You are to meet customers. You are to work on projects which move much faster when you can see people. And a lot of industries, you know, are still very dependent on corporate travel. That's just a fact. Like if you, as I said before, if you are in the marine industry, you need to move your people to go on ships. And, and that's just a reality of the, the industry. If you have people and engineers moving to plants or architects and things like that, you need to get them moving around. Lawyers need to see their customers. And we all know that not all conversations can happen online or even yes. on the phone. You, you know, there is a level of confidentiality and all of that that you cannot reach and, you know, unless you see people face to face. So those things are going to remain. So it might not be the same level as before, depending on the industries. Our bet was let's grow our market share so far so that we are not impacted because at the end of the day, if the business comes back, we have grown our market share, even if our customers individually travel less, we won't have the, the same impact overall because we have grown our market share. So it's compensated by the new customers that are coming on board. So that's very much the, the vision we have. So yeah, I don't know, it, it was a long answer, but in, in short, yes, it will have an impact, um, but corporate travel is here to stay and it's a very important part of doing business, particularly in this region, that's for sure. What's the growth strategy for FCM Travel Solutions Asia in the next 24 months? Uh, the first thing is, as I mentioned earlier, we just announced an acquisition in Japan. So we want to obviously make this acquisition successful, which means implementing all our suite and technology and all of that in Japan, which is a fascinating market and, and start growing um, in the market. It has a huge uh, opportunity. Japan is the fourth largest corporate travel business market in the world. So big opportunity for us. The second thing is consolidating our positioning in China. We just um, invested in a new system in China to build a, a system which is much more connected to the local ecosystem. Um, and, and we are implementing or deploying this system as we speak. And this is going to be, again, a huge area of focus for the next two years. And for the rest is really looking at the opportunities and really nurturing the relationship with our customers to make sure that we are here for them when travel is back and that we can take them through the complexity of travel and help them save money and a lot of uh, troubles along the way. So that, that's what we want to do in the rest of the region for sure. Now I wanna take a different track and ask you Bertrand, how has managing a business that's been decimated by the pandemic and having to then quickly respond, change strategies and stuff, shaped you as a leader? Wow, that, that's a $1 million question. Um, you know what, um, I've, you know, I have to be very honest here. And I think as a leader, sometimes we need to show a bit of vulnerability. And I think it was a time where it was okay to say, you know what, it's very hard. And even for me as a leader in this very complex region, having to make so many uh, decisions which were very hard, it was all about accepting that, you know, you can have your up and downs and you can say that to your people. But all the time, my view is do things with honesty, integrity and transparency. When you explain to people the reason why you are doing very difficult things, people understand. And that was to me the absolute um, 
you know, uh, uh, thing for me, it was like really coming back to my values and making sure that I was not doing anything which would go against my values by doing things with honesty, integrity, and transparency. And that was the big thing, um, you know. So yeah, it, it was hard, let's face it. Um, but, you know, I'm lucky to work for a company which has a huge focus on people as well. So we are not only looking at numbers and things, it's also about the, the people in the business because we believe that that's what makes the company um, the exciting company that it is today. I said earlier that we still have our founder as a CEO, and that was, I think, a big point of difference as well, because the first thing that Screw, our founder, uh, did when all of this happened was to get all our global MDs together and, and starting to think and saying, what do we do? And from that moment, we had one call every single day for three months, including weekends, to work on all of this together. And the teamwork, I think our founder, like he's 72 years old, I think this year, and having him, you know, leading this ship, uh, you know, with all of us behind him and all of that was a massive um, winning factor, I think. And this is probably why we could go through this. So, um, yeah, I, I would say, so um, strongly uh, on if it's if it's the word I choose because I think the position we are in right now is actually quite pretty strong compared to most of our competitors and it's because we made the right decisions at the right time in the right way. Now Bertrand, it's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you very much for taking your time to be on the show. My pleasure. It was really a pleasure having this conversation with you and I hope I will meet you at some point when travel re reopen. Thank you very much. Likewise, I'm Brian Fernandez and I've been speaking to Bertrand Saye, the Managing Director of FCM Travel Solutions Asia on Vistax C-Suite Conversation Show. This video will be on our Facebook and LinkedIn sites as well as our website www.vistax.asia. Please subscribe and like our various platforms. Thank you very much for tuning in.